The archaeological research facility is located in Huishan, the ancestral and unceded territory of Chechenya speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign band, uh, Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community here inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. Therefore, our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native and Indigenous peoples by our actions as well as our words. So today, um, one of our brightest and best has returned to us and all the way back up from the South to rejoin us, Dr. Felicia de Pena, um, who is senior project, senior project director at a powerhouse of archeological research and theory, statistical research incorporated in Redlands. Um, she's back and I won't read it in the title of her talk because you can read it for yourself, but she has worked closely with Dr. Mahar, um, Dr. McDonald at, out of the Epipaleolithic Forager sites and at Corona 4. Um, she has taught us all in her tenure here um, before she became Dr. Depenia in lithic technology. Um, she's done an amazing amount of work with experimental archaeology um, and is uh, definitely one of those folks we point to as having raised the bar for our graduate program. So we're so glad to have her back. Join me in welcoming her. Thank you, June, for Appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for having me here today. I, I do want to start off really quickly with a thank you to Dr. Lisa Hare, Dr. Kent Lightfoot, and Dr. Um, Jeffrey Sass. Um, without you guys, I you know I, it's just been incredible to have you to be able to bounce ideas off of and to work back and forth and kind of build this dissertation and really what I'm going to be presenting here today. Um, I'd also like to thank the ARC for all of the funding and the, the workshops and the faculty and for, um, for you know, technology, right? Like all of this modeling that I've done, I wouldn't be able to do um, without access to the R. Um, I'd like to thank Teresa Paquette because she's the one who taught me how to flint at blade cores. And as you guys are gonna see, this is all about flint at so, um, so I'd like to thank her for her time and her um, love of rock hounding and, and our fascinating discussions. Um, about rocks and how to turn them into blade cores. And then finally, I'd like to thank all of the flint knappers that participated. I had 12 novices and 12 skilled flint knappers participate um, in order to produce the experimental, um, the, the experimental kit, basically all of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of debitage and um, blade cores. So I want to thank everybody who participated in this because without it, it would not be um, what, it, what it is. So uh, today I'm going to be discussing the identification of novice flint knappers in the archaeological record. So we all start off as novices, and I, I love this picture. Right? So we start off as, as little kids, like even, even just adults coming to new technologies. Um, we start off as, knowledge, uh, as novices, and our knowledge of how to perform skills and tasks is inherently and culturally constructed and bound. So the ways that who we learn from affects how we learn a particular act or technology. Um, through an experimental flint knapping project, I was able to demonstrate statistic, statistical significance um, in, and differences between novices, intermediates, and master flint knappers in blade core technology specifically. Um, so I kind of ask, why is this important? Why do we need to know when we're looking at a, a blade core reduction? Why do we need to know that a novice made something or a master made it? Right? And this kind of allows us an extra, um, an extra peek into the to be able to kind of look at um, who's producing what and where and be able to understand these social relationships. So do we have masters interacting with novices, masters with masters, right? It's, it's important to know. Um, and when we're kind of faced with this, right? When we, when we dig this up out of the ground, right? How do we tell? How do we tell that this is somebody who's masterful? Or how do we tell that this is a novice who's use, utilizing a completely different chain of etoire or somebody like, if this isn't following the chain of operations that we're expecting, 
Um, is it a master who's coming in from a different place, right? So there's so many different ways that we can interact with a slave core that maybe doesn't follow the norm. So we're gonna kind of explore that a little bit later. First, I'm gonna talk about Piranha 4 and kind of situate us. Um, so this is you know, a map of the, the Near East. Um, so what we've got, Piranha 4 is an aggregation site. So it's an epithelial aggregation site um, that dates to 18,600 Cal VP to about 19,800 Cal VP, right? Um, it's generally an aggregation site, considered to be an aggregation site, but we have, we have um, millions of different lithics, uh, all of different, uh, many different type of like typologies. Um, so we have microliths are the major form of tool technologies that are used uh, during the epipaleolithic broadly. So not just at Piranha, um, but throughout the, the Middle East and um, North Africa. Um, middle, sorry, um, microliths are the type of tool that people predominantly use during this time period. Uh, the thing to note is that most sites don't have more than one or have a small selection of uh, microlithic tool shapes. So kind of like rectangles or triangles, crescent shapes, right? Most sites only have a small handful. Uh, Piranha has dozens. It has many different types of tool shapes, vinyl tool shapes. And all of the, or not all, but most of the lithics um, are actually formed on local flints. So coming from about 15 kilometers away, uh, which means that people are coming from different places and bringing their knowledge to the site and utilizing the local flint and kind of adding their, you know, their, their understanding of what the tool is to the local resources. Um, other things that we find at Piranha 4, um, we've, there, there have been burials, there are huts, thermal features, activity areas, beads, uh, a, a lot of funnel remains. So it's a really diverse site. And you can see there's, there's, there's significant um, um, kind of housing that's going on. So we know that there are um, hut structures that people are engaging with and that um, they're basically periods of hunting. So there's a very significant component of people actually living at this site. And we have flint mapping floors, um, which we'll talk about a little bit. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get too much into the flint mapping floors um, in this conversation, but hopefully in the future, we'll kind of explore those a little bit further. Uh, there is a flint mapping floor that we will be looking at um, that's that's dated to the early epipaleolithic, and uh, we'll we'll kind of spend more time on that one. So I'd like to talk from from flakes to people. So when we're looking at debitage, right? When we're looking at um, uh, when we're looking at debitage, and we get a big massive um, collection of hundreds or thousands at Piranha, oftentimes it's thousands. Um, of pieces of debitage, right? How do we get to the to the people? How do we get to the knowledge from it, right? And so here I've got a refit blade core um, that I that I worked on. This one's from a like middle Paleolithic site, or sorry, middle Epipaleolithic part of Piranha Four. So it postdates the early Epipaleolithic material that we're going to be looking at, but it has a very similar reduction structure. So we're going to talk about this in just a second. Um, I do want to point out, so we've got all these blades across the bottom. Blades are the predominant, like, the, it's the goal for these blade cores. You can see the blade core kind of has this um, boat-shaped front here. Uh, this is the same blade core from two different sides. And so, uh, so basically what this blade core allows uh, a point effort to do is create these consistent blades uh, that are very regular in shape, and um, that you can turn those into microliths very quickly, right? You can snap them off snap at the bottom, snap at the top, you've got a tool, you can pressure flake them, you can change them and modify them very quickly and they're really light to carry around, right? So instead of carrying around a big hunk of rock, you can carry around a handful of these little blades and they're just incredibly light and durable, especially on this one. Um, the chenepetoire that we would usually see in, in blades like this or blade cords like this, so this one's one that I, I refit. Um, we have early phases. Um, where we have a crested blade kind of coming off here early. Uh, and then there's core tablets. So we have one, two, three little core tablets. We can see them on the opposite side, two, three. Um, and then additional blade core or you know, crested blades here. So these are all kind of earlier reduction pieces that we would see um, that come off of you know, the first stage or the first few stages. So you see that somebody's gone through and taken the cortex off of this side and left the cortex on that side. Um, so we'd see like, you know, initial reduction phases would include that uh, cortex removal 
and creating these nice platforms for people to go through and actually start setting up platforms and creating blades later on. Um, the second stage we have going through, people are, who are producing larger blades like this one. Right? So those blades can then be used for um, more specific tools. So we can, um, we see people are using them for burins, people are using them um, to make scrapers and other types of tools that are kind of heavier duty, um, but they're less common than the bladelets, right? So the, the ultimate goal is the bladelets for these particular uh, tools. Finally, um, once we once we get past those kind of initial larger blade removals, um, we end up going for these smaller blades here. So these little bladelets are generally five centimeters long or a little bit shorter, right? And so these bladelets are ultimately the goal. And in order to maintain this core face, right, in order to be able to consistently produce these blades off of a core like this, you have to actually correct things. So we see this like partially ridged blade down here um, that actually changes the face of the core. It changes the angles, takes off additional material. So that way a flint mapper can then continue to take more blades off of this one particular blade core. So it's a combination, it's never the same thing, right? So if you're gonna flint nap one of these cores, it's never gonna be like A, B, C, D, right? It's a set of ideas, a set of, of processes, a template um, that you're using to kind of generally approach the reduction of this blade core and then um, fixing problems as you go. So flint napping is basically mostly just problem solving. Um, yeah, and then the last thing, once we get down to these parts, uh, again, they can get turned into tools really quickly, and then that's the ultimate part. So in my experiment, what I've been doing is focusing on the production of these blades as opposed to the tool production afterwards. So you'll see the, the work will really stop at blade production. Um, I do want to say it's, it's important for us to keep in mind that, um, that all the flint nap debitage that we're looking at uh, and we'll look at was produced by people who lived, worked, and learned um, and interacted within a community of practice. And so this community of practice ends up shaping the way that they approach these problem solving um, techniques. Right? So fundamentally I've got um, three kind of uh, theoretical paradigms that I've used to structure this experiment. So situated learning is, is a common one that we learn here in the department. So situated learning is really pushing that masters and novices are interdependent. Right? They need to be together in the same space. Masters are, are teaching novices, but novices are also carrying on a tradition. And so in order for tradition to continue, you need both masters and novices coexisting and working. Um, and so these novices are just basically learning through these peripheral interactions to become more skilled at something, at a particular skill. Chen um, is that chain of operations, right? Those reduction sequences that I was just talking about. Uh, and so basically, Chen Abattoir is a, the mental template that flint nappers or pretty much anybody who's producing something um, is it's a mental template for people to follow. It's not necessarily a set of instructions. It's not a set of, um, you know, if you go through first, you have to do this and then you have to do that. It's a general gist of how to approach these technologies and, and the production of them. Uh, and then finally, genetic processes. So this is coming from Saxon Vygotsky. Um, and they're really pushing that a, uh, that a technology and knowledge is a history of knowledge. It's not just a simple thing that has been learned. It's every single person who has interacted with that knowledge beforehand, and it's acquired through a lifetime. So when you get a piece of knowledge from somebody, they've learned it from somebody else with a certain perspective, and then they've learned it from somebody else with a certain perspective. And so this continues on and on. So these bodies of knowledge have long histories that are affected by events in the past. So going from knowledge to skill, right? So we have, uh, we have knowledge, which is incredibly important. So we know that we have particular bodies of knowledge that exist, particular ways of approaching this tool reduction. What does that mean for skill? So skill is one of those um, kind of fluffy terms that we use, right? There's so many different aspects um, traditionally, the way that um, lithic skill is approached, they use regularity, complexity, um, symmetry, right? So a, a lot of kind of more aesthetic ideas of what skill is. Um, but there's also ideas of uh, minimal platform preparation, uh, minimal variation. There's also like minimal uh, thickness for the width of a particular um, lithic artifact. 
right? And so all of these are, um, most of them are based in assumptions. Um, and so there's there's some issues with some of them um, because a lot of times, you know, as, as archaeologists, we see like, okay, this is this is kind of what we see most commonly, right? This is what their this is what their goal was. This is what the aim was. Um, and so we're kind of assuming and placing our ideas of what is normal or what is commonly produced. And we're just kind of assuming that that's the ultimate goal. That was what was considered skill, right? Um, and I think that that's, that's problematic to kind of view the way that we see like regularity, right? Um, to, to kind of force those ideas on an ancient past, right? Um, there's, there's ethnographic examples where people are considered highly masterful, but produced things that um, the ethnographers were like, what's this? Like, <laughs> why is this the same? Um, and that that's like, um, um, what's it? Catherine Weedman Arthur, she did some really interesting work on that. Um, and it was like looking and exploring the different ways that that these people were considered skillful. Um, but so, so moving on from from those um, from those approaches, um, there's a significant um, body of research that then pushes that um, skill should kind of move away from those ideas um, and really take into effect connaissance, right? So the knowledge, right, and then combine it with savoir-faire, know-how. Um, and so again, those are also two very fluffy terms, right? Knowledge and know-how. How do we turn that into something productive that we can analyze, that we can mobilize, that we can actually use to understand the past? Um, so what I ended up doing in order to approach knowledge and know-how um, was I did an experiment, right? So we had a whole bunch of novices, um, 12 novices who um, signed up to participate um, in, in a flint mapping experiment, they did 10 flint mapping sessions with me. Of course, this was over like during COVID. So we had to do this via, um, via Zoom. So this is a still from one of our, um, from one of our Zoom flint mapping sessions um, where people were like, basically like flint mapping. So we'd meet together um, a couple of times a week in some cases. Um, I held multiple flint mapping sessions each week and people could come as it fit their schedule. Um, and we flint napped for about 90 minutes a day. Um, each person was responsible for producing 10 blade cores uh, over that, that time period. And so they were um, they were basically flint napping uh, together. We had kind of a, a nap in uh, via via Zoom. Right. So this this particular experiment here um, was was set up to explore the following six questions, right? So do skilled flint nappers make more mistakes than uh, the, or sorry, do unskilled flint nappers make more mistakes than skilled flint nappers? And what types of errors are they? Um, do unskilled flint nappers produce less core trimming elements than skilled flint nappers? Do unskilled flint nappers prepare flat platforms less frequently than skilled flint nappers? Do unskilled flint nappers batter or crush platforms frequently or more frequently than skilled flat flint nappers? Do unskilled flint nappers or are unskilled flint nappers able to make blades from blade cores consistently? Um, and then are unskilled flint nappers able to effectively utilize their flint napping tool kits in order to make successful removals, right? So each one of the flint nappers was given um, all the flint that they needed. And then, um, you know, all the protective gear, they were given uh, hammer stones. So hammer stones of various sizes, they were given billets um, in order to potentially effectively reduce these cores. Uh, they were also assigned some readings, so some basic flint mapping, like background readings, some Whitaker, um, and then they were given a couple of short videos to watch uh, regarding flint mapping and blade core technologies. I gave them some of this background information because it's, it's important uh, for them to be able to uh, kind of have some general understanding because I, I strongly believe that people in the ancient past would not have had flint mapping in like completely separate place where only flint nappers can know and like, you know, there's most likely some interaction of, of the like the general idea of flint napping. So I thought it was important for the flint nappers to have at least a little bit of background. The, the novices themselves had to have less than five hours of flint napping experience in order to participate. Um, and so, so it was. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun um, troubleshooting and, and dealing with with all of the um, all of the questions. I had so much fun with that one um, for for this. the The skilled flint nappers they went through a different process, right? So the skilled flint nappers, I uh, I worked with the PSK, the Puget Sound Nappers, up in Oregon, 
or sorry, up in, in Washington. And um, they they were wonderful. They had they hosted an app in. I sent them a whole bunch of Flint um, and they hosted a nap in and they produced, um, so there were seven people and each of the people produced two blade cores and they sent them back. Um, I also um, went onto a Flint napping blog site and found a couple of other Flint nappers who were willing to participate. So I had two additional Flint nappers um, and then myself and Teresa Barquette, um, she and I produced five other blades or blade cores in order to analyze and compare um, these, these different, um, the, the different skill levels. Um, everybody had to report their skill level. So, um, so they're reporting either novice, intermediate, or master. And then um, basically I used those reported skill levels to create a like basic understanding of skill. Uh, so I ran all these statistical, um, I did a whole bunch of statistical analyses to kind of cluster what looked like skill from the reported skill. And then I kind of pulled what I thought was an indicator of skill and retested it. And so actually a lot of people got shifted. So a lot of people who had like reported to be master had been shifted down, uh, not down, but had been shifted to novice um, based off of performances that, um, that kind of got flagged in these like skill, skill indicators. Um, and so like, I didn't even, like I had expected to show up as, as an intermediate and like I think two of my cores were master. And I was like, ha ha. Um, and the other three were like intermediate. So um, so it was like, you know, it's exciting. Um, let's see, we're gonna get into the stats um, here real quick. So um, so I'm gonna try not to get terribly bogged down. And this is where the uh, where the assigned skill level versus, um, sorry, the, the reported versus the assigned skill level is important. So for the, the skill level clusters, we did a K or I did a K, K cluster. Um, and so what we have are the Z-score values. So this is skill people, right? And so we see four people are highly, they're, they're producing blades, core trimming elements, multifaceted platforms uh, very frequently, right? And um, irregular blades, which are blades that don't have a very regular form. Um, they're producing those pretty frequently. Uh, regular blades are blades that um, have straight edges. And then extremely regular blades have multiple parallel lines on the dorsal surface and have a, a quote like perfect like form, right? Where they, they taper at the end. Um, they just have this um, very, they have an extremely regular shape um, to them. So they, they just kind of all look, they, they didn't pop out of the exact same machine, right? Um, and so we see that skilled people are able to produce all of these blade types frequently and unskilled people are not, right? Like they're producing lots and lots of plates, right? Um, so, so then to kind of push this a little bit further, uh, I split it apart. I did the K cluster analysis, um, between novices over here. So we have novices are not really producing blades. Um, they're not really producing core trimming elements all that much or multifaceted platforms. Um, they are uh, producing lots of battering, um, lots and, and lots of battering, <laughs> which was interesting and actually like when you look at the video, you, you can actually see it, right? It has to do with like the, the angles that they're using. So they're battering um, a lot of these platforms. Uh, and it, it makes sense, you know, because I absolutely did the exact same thing. Um, and so so then again, kind of have this negative correlation with, uh, with blades. So regular, regular, and extremely regular. Uh, we have the intermediate people here. You see that they're actually producing a significant amount of irregular blades and a pretty decent number of regular blades. Um, and producing blades quite regular as well. And then in the middle, we have the masterful flint nappers, um, consistently producing all of the blades, the core trimming elements, and the multifaceted platforms. Um, and then pretty much the, like they're the main producer of these extremely regular blades and are producing a lot of regular blades. Um, so these are kind of the, the main, um, um, non-metric. So these are these are the main morphological uh, traits that I tested uh, for, for skill. And so this was the way that I kind of separated out novices, intermediates, and masters uh, for, the, for the upcoming um, stats. So some of the things that I tested for, we've got skill, um, again, questioning skill, multifaceted platforms, really important, right? That was one of those things that was assumed um, earlier on, one of the questions that I wanted to ask. We see, so this is the mean. Um, across all of the, um, basically per core, right? And so we see that 
masters are producing over a hundred per core on average um, versus intermediate or novices are, are producing like nine per core. Uh, single faceted platforms, which are non-prepared. So these these un, these unprepared platforms where somebody's not actually like like shaping the platform before they produce it, um, it's pretty consistent, right? Across all of them. So 52, 46, 50 um, across all those skill levels. Um, when we look at that blade regularity, we see that irregular blades, um, this is the mean, so the, the average per core. Um, novices are producing less than one per, on average per core. Um, intermediates are producing about six, masters about four. Um, when we move over to those regular blades, um, novices are producing even less, so 0.4 per blade or per blade core on average. Um, their uh, intermediates are producing six or 7.6, and the masters are producing a lot. They're producing almost like 40 in some cases, right? Uh, sorry, not 40, um, 19. It's really hard to see. Uh, and then um, on the extremely regular side, it's mostly masters who are producing extremely regular blade cores, right? So at, at almost 16 um, blade core, blades per core um, that are extremely regular. So we see that there's this significant shift where masters are much more capable of producing the extremely regular blades consistently um, and regular blades consistently as well. But uh, intermediate people are consistently able to produce blades, right? Uh, I wanted to test the correlation between platform, um, between platform, platform preparation and blades. So blades, core trimming elements, um, and then irregular blades, regular blades, and extremely regular blades. So, uh, so here we have the Pearson's co um, sorry, um, the Pearson's correlation coefficient. For, uh, for each of those types. So this is the relationship between multifaceted platforms, so paired platforms, and the number of irregular blades. So we have a positive relationship here, um, the, the number of prepared platforms, and the number of regular blades, a very positive relationship here, the, the most positive. Um, and then extremely regular blades in the middle. So again, another positive relationship. And then over here on this side, we have those core trimming elements which are used to shape that core in order to produce more blades, right? Um, again, we have that positive relationship between these multifaceted core or blade, multifaceted platforms and the number of core trimming elements. And um, here, um, the total blade count per blade core and the multifaceted platforms here. So we're gonna compare that to the, um, the single faceted platform. So these non-faceted platforms. And we see that there's no relationship really. So there's a negative relationship. So here's the irregular, um, the, the irregular blades, not really a relationship. We have a negative relationship between the regular and uh, and the single faceted platforms. Another negative relationship between the single faceted platforms and blades, and then not much relationship um, between the core trimming elements and blade counts. So I just kind of wanted to present to you the the actual like the, the numbers behind it. So this is for those multifaceted platforms. We have statistical significance for all of them. And then for the single faceted platforms, there's no significant relationship between, um, between the actual faceting of the blade core and the, um, the blades that are produced. We've got a couple more to go through. Uh, so we've got uh, the sequential blades. So now sequential blades are one or two or more blades that were removed that refit to each other. Right, which means that somebody took off a blade and then was immediately able to take off another, potentially another, right? So there's multiple blades that were removed immediately one after the other. Notably, only five of the blade cores were considered master blade cores. So five of five got uh, sequential blade removal, right? Um, the novices, most of them did not have any sequential blade removal. There was I believe, 18, yeah. 18 out of uh, over 160 blade cores um, had refitting um, removals. Uh, and then intermediates, most of them did have refitting, but some of them didn't. So three didn't have any refitting blade or blades on the blade cores. Um, and then over here, we just have a general overview of the averages for each of the blade cores. So we have uh, flakes are most commonly produced. Um, masters are producing a lot of smaller flakes versus novices are producing less but larger flakes. 
Um, blades, we see consistently, masters are always producing more flakes or more blades than everybody else. So it's like 38 blades per blade core. Um, novices, are, or novices are producing one on average and that's, that's rounded up. Um, so producing about one um, blade per blade core. And then um, intermediates are producing 17. So we kind of have this very clear difference in, in how much people are able to produce per blade core. And then the core training elements, I think, is the, the most important here, where we have novices are producing one. Um, and usually those are tablets or, or kind of those earlier stage core, um, core preparation elements. Uh, and then we have um, intermediates who are producing about four, uh, four to six. And then we have masters who are producing 20. So they're consistently producing these, um, these removals that they need to be able to produce in order to create more blades, right? Um, so I think these are very useful ways for us to kind of approach skill. Um, I, that wasn't all of the stats. So if that these kind of, oh God, it's so hard to read up here. I'll read some of them off for you. Um, but there was like length width ratio um, that really only um, allowed for skilled unskilled designation. Um, we have length, which is predominantly skilled and unskilled. We have width, which again is predominantly skilled and unskilled. Um, proximal thickness was, was a really great way for us to approach uh, novice, intermediate, and master. So this kind of goes back to those uh, multifaceted and single-faceted platforms. Medial thickness, so the thickness of a particular blade or any removal, um, is, is also useful for novice, intermediate, and master. So usually if they're consistently thin removals for these blades, um, or kind of indicates skill and it, it indicates um, master um, Distal thickness. Um, kind of in between. So that one's about half um, skilled and unskilled, and then uh, half novice, intermediate, and master. And then finally, mass. Um, mass was less useful for determining skill level. You could determine it through um, the novice, intermediate, master, um, but less on the skilled, unskilled, and no indication. For these qualitative factors that we kind of talked about in the beginning, platform preparation. Um, so a lot of platform preparation indicates intermediate and masterful individuals. High blade frequency into, um, uh, indicates master. Um, high core trimming element frequency indicates masters. Um, high, uh, sorry, sequential blades indicates intermediate and masters. Uh, irregular blades tend to indicate novices or intermediate individuals. Regular blades as, um, as intermediate and master. Extremely regular is associated with master. Blade cores themselves, so um, so artifacts that can be identified as blade cores with removals are intermediate and masters, and then flake cores are pretty decently associated with novices. Um, it, I'm going to say in the experiment, right, because archaeologically, um, flake cores are used for very different things, right, than blade cores. Are. So with that, um, I created a skill assessment questionnaire, so that way I could apply all of that information to archaeological. Um, um, <laughs> to archaeological assemblages. Um, so the first one here, um, um, so we have our blade cores present, yes or no, um, sequential blades present. So these just kind of go through all of those, um, those questions that, that we had, or all of those aspects that I had just outlined in that last slide. Um, and they get points. So, uh, so basically, no plus zero points, yes, plus one. These are ranges, so these are based off of the averages that I got, um, those, those um, significant averages that I got through the stats. Um, and so, you know, novices tending to get like less than 2% of it, uh, of each assemblage of the core trimming element, right? So novices would get zero points here. Um, if it was less than 7%, then that indicates an intermediate, you get one point, and then um, you know, two points for over 8%, right? And so basically I used that information to create this skill assessment questionnaire. Um, once you add all of them up, if you got zero to five points, you're a novice, uh, six to 11 points, you're an intermediate, and 12 to 17 points, you're a master, right? Uh, this is kind of fun because then you can kind of rank people as well. So then you can kind of see like, oh, this is kind of a lower range master, right? So some people are scoring like 13 or some people are scoring 12 and it's like, okay, great. Like, this person is like skilled, they're an intermediate and they're showing off this skill, they're almost there, right? Um, and you can kind of like go back and forth and, and um, see like where they rank within that skill level. 
Um, this I tested by using three cores that I produced. So one I produced when I was first learning how to flint nap, um, one that I produced in like 2020 um, when I was kind of getting it, and then one that I had produced after doing like an entire summer of flint napping, just gearing up for this project. Um, and so like they, they fell right in um, novice, intermediate, and master, just bing, bang, boom. So that was, um, that made me feel much better about this particular questionnaire. Um, I also, because I'm focusing on caches, um, also did a cache test where, um, where I was looking at um, the, the caches and basically created a representative cache and tested it using the same thing. Um, and I was able to tell the difference between skilled and unskilled individuals, um, where like the caches basically, um, the intermediate cache got moved up. So it was like a low level master's cache and the master cache stayed very high rank in the master. Um, so where it had initially, when I had the entire assemblage, it had been intermediate because the because of the caching event, it got boosted up into like a low rank of master. All right, so uh, in the last few minutes, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna go into these caches um, and actually like look at the archeology span of them. So all of these caches are coming from early epipaleolithic um, assemblages at Piranha. And so here we've got, um, we've got these three caches here, which are distinct caches. This is the flint mapping floor that I was talking about earlier. And then so we have these concentrations. So one, two, three concentrations. So this, um, this checkerboard pattern here um, indicates this very unique material. It's um, this translucent flint um, that I was able to track across various parts of, of this, this region. Um, and tested that because it was, it was very unique and not a particular material that we see at Piranha very often. Um, so let's see here, uh, the floor that I'm looking at, so 043 is that large flint mapping floor. And so that post dates uh, the, the huts. So it's, it's dated after 19,200 years. And then I did pull another cache from another part of the site. So this is area E, it's also early epipaleolithic, uh, and the radiocarbon dates underneath of, um, underneath of 014, the one that I'm looking at, um, that's also rated uh, aged to 19,200 years. So they're about the same time period, and this one's for a little bit earlier, most likely, than the, um, than the 043 and the other part of the site. So um, really quickly, of these caches and cores, there were seven of them that I focused on. Um, there were seven refit sequences with a total of 30 refits here. None, none, none on two, three, and four. Um, cache number five had 17 refits, or sorry, um, had two refits and then one refitting sequence. Um, this clear concentration uh, that I was telling you about with those, um, with those checkerboards uh, had a total of 199. Five of those were refitting in two different sequences. And then that area E cache um, had a total of 158 with 32 refitting artifacts and 13 separate refitting sequences. Okay, we're gonna take a look at these. This is the most highly skilled. So the one that we saw in the beginning uh, was the most highly skilled cache. Um, so when we have them across, we have these refits here. These are all refits here. The blades, the tools, the blade core itself. Right. And so this one um, ended up being ranked at 16, so almost the highest, right? So out of 17, it got 16, very masterful. There's sequential blade removals, um, a diverse array of core trimming techniques and um, thin and prepared platforms. Um, it's just really went through and, and kind of showed all of the different um, techniques and skills that you would need to be considered a, a masterful core. Again, this is the most masterful out of all of them. And we'll kind of look at this, this the dispersal in a second. Um, look at cache number two. This one ranked a little bit lower. This one was um, was at a 15. Um, again, so this one had a high frequency of thin and prepared platforms and one pair of sequential blades. So not as many as the previous. Uh, it also had high blade to flake ratio and high proportion of regular and extremely regular blades, which is easier to do when you have a smaller cache. Um, uh, like a, that's, there's issues with the caches um, that I'd like to explore a little bit further. Um, so number three and number four, these two show the least amount of skill out of all of them. 
So they, um, they show, they come in as a 13, which is the bottom of masterful. So, um, so intermediate ends at 12 and masters at 13. Um, and so these two are showing, uh, these two are showing less skill than all of the other caches and concentrations within the area. And they have a high flake ratio, flake to blade ratio, uh, but also um, not any um, regular, extremely regular blades. They're mostly irregular. Uh, concentration number five uh, was had a, a score of 14. Um, there's a wide variety of different uh, core trimming elements that are taking um, place here. So that's kind of why it scored so, so highly. Uh, but there's also an, a large number of extremely regular blades. Uh, look at concentration number six. Uh, one of my favorites, this one, I spent a lot of time refitting. As you can see, there's over like 30 refits here. Um, and they're extremely consistent, these removals, these little blade bits that are coming off. Um, so we see there's there's um, the sequential blades and um, and significant refits and a lot of different core trimming techniques, not to mention a, uh, a blade tool, uh, which was the only blade tool in all of these caches and concentrations that I had looked at. Uh, this is lipid concentration number seven. So that clear material uh, that, that we were looking at a little bit earlier, uh, we see that there's a significant uh, presence of core trimming elements and lots of little blades and bladelets. They're very regular, so they, they tend to be regular and some extremely regular blades uh, through here. And then we have some core trimming elements over here. Um, there's there's a, a bunch of photos. I just kind of picked up a, a few of them um, because they're all coming from different places around the site. This is the concentration of those. So the red had over a hundred of those clear artifacts, right? Those, those clear flint uh, pieces of debitage. Uh, and then this like light green area here um, had about 25 of them. So there, there's less, but we can see even one of the caches had that clear material in it. Uh, which which was interesting because they're you know spatially related to each other within that working floor. Uh, overall, uh, in this particular area, there was over ten thousand artifacts um, from from this red square here, and about you know between four thousand and six thousand in this yellow square, and less than three thousand in this green square. So um, so these these are the three that I actually analyzed the flint mapping for. Um, and then, so we see that these uh, these, these concentrations and the um, uh, the caches are actually you know spaced they're placed in those spaces. Um, and so, what I ended up kind of determining was that we have likely multiple people represented in this flint mapping floor, right? So we have some people who are very highly skilled who are able to produce those fifteens and sixteens. Uh, but then we also have some people who are a little less skilled, but still very skilled, right? So we have people who are producing those 13s and 14s, right? I think it's most likely that somebody was probably sitting around here and doing that flint mapping because anybody who's flint mapped knows that all the debitage lands like two feet that way. Um, and so it's, it seems pretty likely that somebody was probably flint mapping over here and building up all this debitage um, over, over on this side. We have the most skilled uh, cache is actually located right here. Um, and then these two are those uh, these lower skilled caches um, that we had. So those 13s are showing up there. Um, and then um, from there, um, I'm, I do believe that flint napping here is a communal behavior or endeavor, right? Where we have at least two flint nappers likely um, likely represented between those two different skills, um, those two different skill levels that we see. Although they're both masters, there's there's that like high like skill master and the, the lower skill master. So I, I think that we're seeing um, at least two people coming together and, and possibly more than that. Um, also from the debitage, um, novices probably weren't working in this area. Um, and so I, I want to explore those flint mapping floors more thoroughly. I didn't get a chance to be able to do the metric analysis on them. I only did the qualitative analysis on them. Um, and so the, the qualitative analysis shows that the floors are produced by skilled individuals. So uh, with the ability to go through and do the metric analysis, hopefully I'll be able to kind of tease that apart and maybe see some of those indicators of novices in that space. Um, but without that, um, basically what, what I can say at this point is that the novices are not representative, not represented within these caches or these concentrations.
Um, so yeah, so that was um, that was my research. I had a lot of fun uh, doing all like so much flint napping, <laughs> uh, years and years of flint napping, and working with a lot of fun people um, who also got really enthused by flint napping. Um, and I just really enjoyed being able to uh, bring that research and kind of merge it here um, with the the debitage and these assemblages at Piranha Forum. So thank you, and and uh, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Well, what do you think you can have to do that? What are they? What are they? You find the answer. Were they left behind with these flint when they were going to re use them at some point? Or what do you think they Yeah, so I think that there's the potential that the caches are something that people are going to return to. Um, I, I do also think that there's the potential that they could be learning events as well, um, because the, the caches are composed of, of microlithic tools. They're composed of various types of debitage. So, um, so they're, they, they have flakes in them, they have chips in them, but then they also have like torture means, right? And so, so they have, they're, they're not just tools. They're not just, you know, blades for tool production. They kind of show all of these different aspects of the reduction process, but not the whole like you know part of the process. So they notably lack the initial um, like the initial reduction phase. Yeah. So there's rarely any um, primary uh, reduction yeah. um, or tablets or anything. It's yeah. usually secondary and tertiary reductions that it's it's showing. So I think it's something that people are likely coming back to to like modify later or utilize at a different time. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I want to just kind of follow through. The, did the, you're saying that the, second, that the secondary and tertiary reductions are happening in the novice caches as well as in the master caches? Well, so um, so I don't have any novice caches. The okay. Like it would be the, all of the caches were in uh, the master full range. There's just the like less skilled masters and the more skilled masters, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the the resolution that I have on on those. And so um, all of like all of the caches and and concentrations themselves generally show at least blades and flakes, and in a lot of cases they usually show blades and torture me elements. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a range in the that are shown there. Did you get the feeling though that like you know when I was training on the team shop. You know, we were allowed to take bar stock through the mill or the lathe to a certain point as apprentices. And then the master machinist would take over and bring it to fruition as a finished part for a client, right? So there's yeah. like a so are you are you getting that sense that the novices were there to do the grunt work and then the masters took over? Yeah, so that's actually one of the things that I want to explore while looking at those flint having floors. Um, because I know um, through through the the experimental work that novices are really capable of producing lots of flakes, right? And so if you want somebody to like take the cortex off of like your your potential blade cores, like you could hand that to a novice and they'll do a great job. Like they're producing these massive, beautiful primary flakes, like wonderful, right? Um, and so you can you can hand that labor off and like build up their dexterity, build up their hand eye coordination, and still have them interacting with this. Um, so I, I do believe that that's that's absolutely a potential, and I, I want to look more into it. Oh, thank you so much. I, I knew you were sitting on the outside of our class. But I was thinking about it, so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I am all of your experimental work is super, and allows you to really see the data. I so style is one of the things that I absolutely wanted to approach, and was actually the reason why I did a lot of refitting was to be able to understand style 
Um, and with the, the caches in the area A, so where, where all like six of those uh, caches and concentrations came from, I wasn't able to make enough refits to really be able to get into style. I will say that the concentration in um, in area E, right, so, so dozens of meters away, um, does look significantly different, right? So the, the blades are actually notably na more narrow and they're produced on, um, on like a, a different, a very different type of flint. So it's this very deep chocolatey brown flint as opposed to the, the light brown flint that we're seeing in area A. Um, and so, so there are differences within those, like the, the six in area A and the one in area E. And so, so that one I, I do like want to explore more. I know that the cache continues on in a different place and I want to explore that and see how many more refits can come from that uh, reduction there. Um, but I think style is, is also going to come up a little bit more effectively uh, in the fanatic core. So I think being able to actually look at, because uh, there's, there's over 10,000 artifacts in like in just these three like meters square. And so like to be able to look through and kind of for this entire area. Um, I think that I'll be able to get a better resolution on style and hopefully identify at least. So I, I'm not necessarily hopeful for individuals, but I am hopeful for like educational lineage. Well, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I was wondering if there were in your indices of the, of the learner. Mm -hmm. um, did you also suggest to me that we might find that we're not so lucky to have classes if you just have a bunch of technology for and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Are you taking measurements of things like um, step tractors and things that are technology? Yes, Maybe yeah, I did. Uh, I just didn't present it here because mm -hmm. uh, I was a little short on time and there's so many statistics. Um, but yes, yeah, so, uh, so things like um, hinge, like hinge termination, step terminations, um, battering on platforms. Um, so we see battering is, is associated with novices uh, almost exclusively, um, but we do see crushing, right? So, so platform crushing is very consistent in, um, in intermediates and masters, right? And so, so the, like, it's, it's a little bit different in like, you know, the battering where you have like multiple, you know, tr attempts to try to break something off with brute force versus crushing um, where you're just using like too heavy of a hammer or something. Um, and so we see a lot of crushed platforms in skilled individuals and not so in, um, in novices. Um, step fractures you see pretty consistently across the board in these blade technologies. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, more to do with the nature of the actual like shape of the blade pores. Um, and then hinging, interestingly, uh, was something that I found among skilled individuals. So, um, but so again, so to note, interest, um, the hinge terminations were found with skilled individuals, but they were also able to fix them, right? And so this is, this is the key point, um, because uh, when we see hinging, that then is unable to be fixed, then that's a novice, right? So hinging that is then fixed is something that shows skill. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so hinging, like you know, is, is present um, pretty much across the board, but fixed hinges um, are, are associated with skill. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, Lisa says um, thanks. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be a hard question. <laughs> yeah, I know, geez. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.
It's been so long. Have you been able to get back to the Yeah. I remember I'm dating Yeah, I was out there trying. I still got that. 